Let us again go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to speak from your word and to see a historical event and perspective given there, as well as how it applies to our walk before you even today, the world's powers and how fragile all these things are before you as the holy God of the universe. God is now in our study. We ask it in your son's name. Amen. So, I smile a little bit on verse 6 there to see the king. Well, this is Nebuchadnezzar's son, his knees knocking. Let's, just for a moment here, I have a few slides to tell us about what's gone on and to come to the place that we are in history as you read those things. First of all, Nebuchadnezzar ruled from 605 to 562 B.C. The kingdom lasted about 25 years after his death. He was followed by his son, Evil Merodach. He reigned two years and was assassinated. In 560 B.C., Neriglisar, brother-in-law of the evil Merodach, succeeded him. Neriglisar died in 556 B.C. B.C. and was succeeded by his infant son, Labashe Marduk. He was slain by conspirators, and Nabonus was placed on the throne. Cyrus, Cyrus is rising to power in Persia. Babylon and the Medes were allies against Assyria. Babylon had become a mighty empire, so had the Medes. And this is located northeast of Babylon across the Zagros Mountains. The Bandus of Babylon made an alliance with Cyrus of Persia to counter the Median threat. The Bandus captured Tima in northern Arabia and made it his second capital. The crown prince, Belshazzar, was left ruling in Babylon. In 550 B.C., the Median Persian armies met in battle. Cyrus defeated the Medes and had a kingdom reaching from the Persian Gulf into Asia Minor. In 539, Cyrus turned toward Babylon. The second major kingdom is about to be in place. And remember the statue we talked about in each portion of that that Nebuchadnezzar had seen. And everything there in purple is what will become the that empire, the Medo-Persian empire. Cyrus will uh, be uh, the king of all of that empire. That is a massive amount of land to be under the rule of any person or persons. So we get to Daniel chapter 5. Daniel was taken captive in 606 B.C. It is now 539, 66 years later. Cyrus has, done, has dug a channel to divert the Euphrates and was waiting for the right time to move into the city of Babylon. Belshazzar was having a great feast, many nobles, and much drinking. And they drink from the vessels brought from the temple in Jerusalem. How do you think that will turn out? Not well. A hand writes on the wall, and in these terms, many, many, tikal, yufarsin, to number, to weigh, and to divide. Now, I understand the knocking of the knees, as I'm sure we all would, if suddenly, particularly, uh, these people are not sober at this moment, and anything they see for them can be a vision or whatever, but it was not comforting to see what they saw. So Daniel interprets. Belshazzar had not learned from Nebuchadnezzar. Remember? Uh, being alive, I, I read some commentators who said he, they pro, he surely uh, could understand there would have been a common story to know that Nebuchadnezzar had for a period of time 
been crazy, walked about in the wilds as a wild animal, then came back and said, praise God, praise the God of the universe, for he can make people humble. He can take you down. And he learned that lesson. Uh, Daniel 5.22 says, But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew this, knew all this. So he had been taught that God is in control and that he must humble himself before God. What happened to dad could happen to you, son, or, you know, whatever, uh, in the lineage of, uh, of this man. So as we see all of this and how it all fits in, I have a little bit of a hard time following all the, from even what I read you from the history of this to where he fits in. But he's of the lineage, and he is at a time to be in command. And this is where that don't mess with. Don't mess with God. The end. Uh, not that this doesn't have some application to even what we were talking about this morning in Sunday school. It does, right? What were you thinking? How is this going to turn out? Oh, you weren't thinking. And of which, of course, is why we stand so adamantly opposed. I know that in this day and age we live, that so, it's so easy from people to say, well, you know, a beer here, a little bit of wine there won't hurt anything. Yeah, and, you know, recreational use of some of pot or any other thing, it won't hurt you. It makes me feel better. It does. Of course it does. Any of us can take the mental away from the uh, physical pain, of course. But far too often, what separates is reason from the mentality. And while as a beverage, in ancient times, people drank wine, yes, not wine like you buy today, more like your old Welch's grape juice in the back of the refrigerator, that when you drink that, you don't even like the taste of it. But it has changed. I remember years ago, uh, I, I may have told story, I don't know, but I, it's one that stands in my memory because uh, Jared's mom and I were youth directors in a uh, church, and we were having a harvest uh, party. And we had invited, and there was... We had a youth group at that time, about 45 or 50 kids, and with their friends and everything, we expected probably over 100 kids to come to a youth fellowship. So we bought cider, and we bought numerous bottles of it, only to find out the kids didn't like it. They didn't want the cider. Very few wanted it. I got pretty sick of cider myself over the next few months, and by the last jar or two of that, it had changed. It was no longer the same apple cider that we had started with, and I didn't care for the taste. But, of course, we didn't want to waste any money. We drank it anyway. And I would have to say, probably my closest experience to ever having hallucinations as a youth director. <laughs> Tell you that story just to say, it's different what we talk about. Our church covenant says we'll abstain it's a promise we make to each other that as a drink, as a, there's plenty of things in the world to drink for a beverage other than that. If the doctor says, take some cough medicine, you're probably going to take more alcohol than you do in other things anyway. But, and I, I tell you, I'm not opposed to medicinal use of, of marijuana or any other thing that, that God created. Guess who created that? God created that. And I think probably for that reason, for you to figure out that when you needed to use it medicinally, it had a purpose. But be, you know, let's take a little note from Belshazzar. We can be vile under the guidance of a artificial spirit. And so the end comes. Quickly, does it not? 
chapter 5, 30 and 31. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. When the Lord decides to do something, of course, it doesn't take long. He could have had the moment that their lips touched the vile drink in the righteous articles of the temple, they could have been killed. Remember, it uh, didn't take a whole lot of touch on the Ark of the Covenant when he said, don't touch the Ark. It's, on the, it's being carried away and it wobbles and somebody reaches over to stabilize it and they fall dead. So, there were things we should not mess with. We've joked about this, but if they'd ever discover the Ark of the Covenant, regardless of Harrison Ford or a movie about it, if somebody ever finds it and walks up to it, and if I were there, they would say, well, let's go touch it. I would say, you first. Because uh, even to this day, I'm not so sure that that doesn't still cover it. So Babylon falls in an evening. How long does it take for an empire to fall? In a moment. Now I must say that this is an ingenious plan. Cyrus opens the gate to the new channel, diverts the river, and enters the city through the old river bed. A fortress no one can penetrate except that they had flowing through the ancient city a portion of, they say, uh, as I read, it says probably more of a portion of, but enough of the river to hydrate the hanging gardens. Remember, one of the wonders of the ancient world is the hanging gardens of Babylon. Well, they had to water it from somewhere. They watered it from the Euphrates. Well, they just let it come into the walls. Well, Cyrus, you know, in, a, in today's world, you would get news of this. But did nobody know what was being dug outside of their walls? This would not have been very far away, but some distance, enough so that a channel of water could carry off the river. Did someone not tell the king, hey, they're building something up north, and it's, you know, it's that guy Cyrus who wants to overcome us. Eh, don't worry about it. Well, one evening, they had to worry about it because he said, pull the switch or pull the cord or pull the lever or whatever it is, and they walked in to Babylon. They walked in in the riverbed. They walked in to Babylon and conquered it. A hard time? Yes. Belshazzar wasn't too happy about it. One vibrant evening of partying and he's dead. And I am sick and tired of hearing about it. As every adult is, every counselor, every school teacher, every friend who has lost a friend way too early in life because of some mistake, because of a decision they made under the influence of an alcohol or a drug or anything else that controls people, we say, get rid of them, and I still believe there should be a drug war going on. But we want, of course, to legalize everything, and now we have. What shall we do? Our society is already learning, we pay the price. Let's legalize gambling. Oh, you don't gamble? Well, life is a bit of a gamble, so yes, I do. But what we're talking about is producing, taking your God-given resources to take a chance. How can God bless that? Now, if by some chance... I win the publisher's clearinghouse one of these days, and you say, Brother McFarlane, you have $60 million, now what do you say? I will say, I'm sorry, 
I repent, and let's do something good with it. <laughs> I haven't faced that. I doubt that I ever will. But you have to enter it to get it. So if it goes in, I will say my wife mailed that back in for me. But uh, is gambling a 25 cent stamp or whatever? A little bit. It's not the amount, right? It's the principle of the amount. And, you know, just a little bit. What? What amazing results happen from uh, a discrepancy in our choices and how things go as according to how God said they should be. So Darius the Mede is made ruler over Babylon. The second kingdom of Daniel 2 is now established. All right, so we see that statue. Move into Daniel chapter 6. And as you see that portion open, there is a term. Of course, in King James, the term is used as prince. The actual term underneath that is uh, satrap, but 120 satraps, Persian kisatrap, or governors, are set over Darius's portion of the kingdom, which is Babylon plus, I don't know, the actual portion that Darius has given kingdom. He's not over the whole kingdom. He's over a portion of it. And over his portion, he appoints 120 governors, essentially, to help with that. And three over them, three presidents, are over the governors. And Daniel is one of them. How far has Daniel come as a prisoner to now be in partial control of a huge kingdom? Daniel chapter 6, verse 3 uh, through 5 says, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave uh, thought to setting him over the whole realm. What? The whole portion? So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. They didn't like him getting the attention. And yet when they tried to find some reason to get his name thrown out, two against three, the other two could find nothing wrong every time they tried to find something daniel is perfect in his walk sinless no he's not sinless but he is as good a representative as we can find at this moment in time for the people of god to a foreign kingdom to a people who are oppressing them who have him prisoner and yet what does he do he's exemplary in his conduct I think I said this last week, I say it again, that this ought to show us that God's people can be God's people no matter what the political arena is around them. God's people have always asked to be faithful to him and to do what's right for him, even in times of oppression. Under the Romans, under a time when you know, just for sport, uh, Christians were fed to lions. Not a great time to be a Christian, but they, they still observe, right? People still were serving God, or they wouldn't be caught. That little fish symbol that has come to represent a lot of things Christian, that was the sign etched into some doorposts so that in early days people knew that as they were walking inside this place was a church. They didn't put billboards up, things like we do now. They met in secret and yet eventually were discovered 
and were found. And through the years and through centuries, even to the times we live in today, there are places in this world it is not safe to live if you are of the Christian faith. If you are at least a believer in Christ, you are at risk of being killed. There are areas, and I should say this, you may not realize it, but in the land of Israel, in Palestine, throughout whether it's Christian, I mean uh, Jewish or Muslim, it is against the law to convert anybody to Christ. It's against the law. You're not allowed to openly uh, witness to people. We have missionaries there. We have churches in there. How do they function? Well, their outreach program is a bit unique. They don't promote themselves. They don't put ads in the paper. But they testify to friends and neighbors all the time. And they tell of Jesus. And they still do that. It's against the law in China. Years ago, I read a story about uh, how this worked in a more oppressive time than even now. But uh, unless you were a state-recognized church, and this used to be the way it was in Russia as well, unless you were state-approved, you, know, you couldn't exist. Well, uh, a reporter made an interesting observation. He went to a church service, and for about 20 minutes, they heard very mild kind of political talk that didn't mean much. And then to dismiss the service, they called on someone to dismiss in prayer, and that individual prayed for 40 minutes and preached a sermon on Christ. They made it. They did it. The government had no problem with that. And um, it can be done. So don't fear any incoming regime in our country any more than you would fear anyone else. Know that the times are at hand, that at any moment, not just in America, but this whole world, there are powers rising that are set to do what we read in the book of Daniel and what we read in the book of Revelation. There is a time coming when we might have to meet in secret again. There is coming a time. It may be at risk of life to be called a Christian. And such was the time that Daniel lived in. So the plot they get Darius to sign a law that for 30 days no one can make a petition or prayer to anyone except Darius. As was his custom three times daily, Daniel opened his windows and prayed toward Jerusalem. He didn't do this in the background. He did just standing at his window. He was observed by the other two. They had found a way to get to to Daniel. So Daniel is reported. The rulers report Daniel's petition to God. Darius is very sad. He likes Daniel and did not want to see him die. But the law could not be changed. This is the custom of the Medes and Persians. Once a law is made, it cannot be changed by anyone. They knew that regimes change and people change, but the law should not change. Not every culture has that belief. So what happened? And here's our story. From our nursery rhymes to our adult life, we hear of Daniel being put into a den of lions. The den was sealed Darius fasted all the night, waiting to see if Daniel would be spared. And therefore, that's that picture that has been in the background of our slides for last week and this week. 
And here it is. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid in the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Next morning, then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me. Because I was found innocent before him, and also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on him, because he believed in his God. I believe by... We don't, we'll have to see the reruns in heaven when God shows the reruns of Daniel and the lion's den. Right? Wouldn't you like to see that? There are things that I hope somehow in time, in eternity perhaps, that God will allow us to have the ability to see and maybe to be able to look back in time and see how it looked when it happened. There are instances. This is one of those. I'd like to see what it was like down in the den. I'd like to see how God saw him. I'd like to see how the lions looked at him. And perhaps they were nothing more than kittens and played with him all night for all we know. But they didn't harm him. I'd like to see the faces on the individuals who walked through the, de- the Red Sea on dry gla- ground with walls of water on each side as God opened. I mean, Hollywood can do some great things. But I think it's even better with the real thing. There are a lot of things, and even moments that are sad, and moments that are exciting, all of those things, but we do have the record. This isn't just a story, uh, a, a mythology. This is a true story. This is a true happening. You're reading history at this portion of Daniel. I know Daniel is a prophet. I know the book of Daniel has a lot of prophecy to speak about. But this is history. This has happened. And we are giving this story to our kids. You know what? We need to give the story to us as well. It's not just a nursery story. It's a story for all ages. It's a story for you and me to understand. It was not a good time to be the other two guys. Death for the rulers. Darius had the plotting men cast into the lion's den along with their Oh, neither should you be married to these guys, wives and children. Daniel 6, 24, And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Oh, they were trained animals. You hear people say that. Oh, they were zoo animals. They, does that sound any less wild to you, what's just happened? That's what would have happened with Daniel had God not intervened. So what's our story? God protected Daniel. So what do you think he can do for you? This is why this is not a story that's just for kids. This is a story for all of us. It's the point of the matter. Why we have to pause a little bit in this great book. And, you know, you can tell some stories and go through pretty quick with some of it. But this is one of those stories you got to just stop and look at for a little bit. This is that moment. And this is a place where we are uh, asked And called upon to just for a moment, just think about what happened. We go, oh, that is just such a wonderful story. Uh, Get the whole story. Get it from where we started today. Taking on the God of the universe by saying, and you know, let's drink out of the 
the gold out of the temple. Why was, you know, you just go, you didn't listen to Nebuchadnezzar? You don't, you did not get the story? Daniel says in the word here, it says he understood. He knew. He knew what happened. And he still says, I'm the big guy. Well, I'm assuming so, that, but I don't have the complete understanding. But I assume he'd already been drinking a little bit. Many decisions are made that are incredibly poor under the influence of mind-changing, even mind-numbing substances. Why is it so hard for someone who drinks or someone who uses substances to say, and they usually hate this when somebody comes up to them and says, hey, you need a little help. How dare you? How dare you ask me about that? It's because the substance is speaking. You know, psychologically, uh, mental health-wise, therapists know this, and they tell this to their clients and the families that you want to help somebody, they can only really be helped at some moment when they realize that they cannot be helped. You have to be ready to be there for an individual who, when they finally say, say it and believe it and are ready for it, say, I can't anymore on my own. I need help. And a lot of people, even then, our treatment programs do all sorts of things. They help us conquer uh, a substance. You fail to think of how strong the substance is in anything in life. People don't just get addicted to cocaine. They don't get addicted to crack or alcohol. They get addicted to Cheetos and everything else in life. They get addicted to dollars and money and power and position. And that's all it is here right where we live. Those are all the same things that seem to matter. How many times have you watched a movie and some guy, you know, this is like, like the old, almost all of the old James Bond movies, right? There's somebody who sets out to conquer the world. What do they want? They're already rich. They all, everything, everything. what do they want? I, uh, I want the world, uh, the world's resort. And of course, not a problem if you got James Bond around, right? He seems to be able to do what armies can't do, go in and stop an adversary who has a tremendous monologue about how their, all things will be and how things will be. A good movie to watch about how this is is uh, the animated movie The Incredibles. If you haven't watched that for a while, Go back and watch it, and one of the characters gets upset, and he tells Mr. Incredible, man, you got under my skin. You're making me monologue. <laughs> you know? It's silly, but that's, you say, what? Well, there's people doing that right now. There are people in high places with powers beyond ours that aren't satisfied with their little bit of it. They want more of it. And let me tell you that that happens even in little ponds. There are people who want in their own little pond to be the big fish. And you know what we're talking about. And you probably know somebody somewhere in some place that is not content to be with the rest of the fishies, but wants to be the big fish, wants to be the predator. I feel sorry for that individual because there is absolutely only one ultimate power in this universe. And when you say, don't mess with God, 
I think you don't mess with God. Let God put into place who has the power. And when they're in power, we pray for them and we ask them to be reasonable and to be, you know, understanding of what God's given you as a stewardship. And yet many, many are driven by the power and the money rather than the idea of service to your community and to your people. I don't care what country it is. I don't care what the community is. It's happening right here in Madras. Right? There's probably somebody who says, it'd be dumb probably to use the terminology, but uh, I want to be the the king. I want to be the governor of Madras. Well, a big fish, a little pond has it pretty good, but, you know, for a while. But there is a day, all of us, Belshazzar, let's drink wine out of the gold. And then that night, he meets God in judgment. How about a people who will submit to this and find out in all of their fortifications, all that they've done, spent millions of dollars of and funds of that time to build a city that's impenetrable, but they forgot to look about the draining system. Dry up the river, they walk in. Bummer. Who's, whose job was that? Who forgot to look for that? We smile a little bit, but this is what I know. The same God that shut lions' mouths is the God that today I'm relying on for every single thing in my life. I don't know how it all turn out, but I know that right now what I need is the lions to shut up. And there's only one voice to make that happen. And that's my God. And he will shut the mouths of the lions. You ready to take that part of faith into your life and to apply it and to live it? If that's what you need today, then will you do that while we stand this morning?